Good morning. Good morning. Just a couple of announcements. <clears throat> um, one right after the service today, we'll have the committal for Chuck Mc McNallan, um, and we'll process out of the church and over to the columbarium. And then my second announcement is that we do have a bishops committee meeting today, also after after the committal service. So if anybody's interested in joining that, you're always welcome. And so those are the only two announcements that I have. Are there any any others? Okay. Good morning and welcome to St. Michael and All Angels Episcopal Church here in beautiful Blanket. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be you, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, 
and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which your son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility. That in the The first reading is from the book of Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days at that time I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is your righteousness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 25 in the Book of Common Prayer, page 614. <clears throat> Let's read it um, responsively by half verse. <clears throat> to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be humiliated, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Let the treacherous be disappointed in their schemes. Show me your ways, O Lord. And teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. In you have I trusted all the day long. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love. For they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your love. And for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Gracious and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners in his way. He guides the humble in doing right. And teaches his way to the lowly. All the paths of the Lord are love and faithfulness. 
to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. The second reading is from 1 Thessalonians. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. We'll sing the Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth.
Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please sit. Distress among nations, roaring sea and waves, fear and foreboding. Our reading from the Gospel of Luke this morning doesn't start out as if it's good news. Now, the spoiler alert for this uh, sermon is that it is good news. But before we jump ahead to the good news, Let's allow ourselves a little bit of time to imagine the approach of the Son of Man. You know, the the Bible tells us that we are supposed to be like children, and I think that this is a good example. Children don't have to decide to imagine something. If you tell a story with good enough details, imagining happens automatically. But adults sometimes need reminding. So think like a child while you listen to these details and allow your imagination to get going. This should sound familiar. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. What are you imagining this looks like? People are going to be fainting in fear. There isn't supposed to be any doubt that the approach of the Son of Man is some scary stuff. A few verses later, Luke tells his readers to be on guard, to be alert at all times praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place. Am I strong enough to escape? How how can I be alert at all times? How is this helpful advice, Luke? When I think in terms of my own strength, my own ability to pay attention 100% of the time, well, I know that that's not possible. And in that case, the coming of the Son of Man sounds pretty scary for me, too. So where is the good news? We have to look more closely. The Son of Man is coming. The kingdom of God is drawing near. The first hint that this is a good thing rather than just a scary thing is the parable, the metaphor that Jesus uses. He talks about new growth on a fig tree as the sign that the summer is coming. Now, especially around this time of year, we hear people say that their favorite season is fall. And particularly in Texas, where our summers can be brutal, fall can feel like a relief. And I know many of us are enjoying cooler weather. But in terms of seasonal symbolism, there's something pretty special about seeing the first new growth on plants after the winter. Now, after last year's freeze, many of us looked at our yards and wondered what would make it. Everything looked dead. Everything looked terrible. There wasn't anything to do but give it time and wait and see what would come back. At our homes, also here at church, we cut all the dead growth away and we waited. At home, we had a lacy oak in the far back corner of our backyard, and it looked particularly bad. It's not a very big tree, it's not a very old tree, and it was terrible. There were no signs of life, nothing. Other things were coming back, but still there was nothing from this tree. And then finally, well past early spring, there was new growth. Not on the trunk, not on the limbs, but coming up from the roots. New growth on a plant is not a sign of bad things to come. It's a sign of health, of hope, of providence, prosperity. In an agrarian society, new growth means you've made it through the lean months. Days are longer, times are better, winter hardship is coming to a close. Jesus compares the onset of summer to the onset of the kingdom of God. Like summer, the kingdom of God will bring health, hope, prosperity, providence, When the kingdom of God arrives, we will will have made it through the hard times. 
It's not just that this isn't bad or it's not scary. This is great news. We can also look back in Luke's gospel to learn more about the kingdom of God. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus instructs his disciples to go out in pairs. They were to heal the sick and tell people, the kingdom of God has come near you. The kingdom of God has come. Past tense, present tense. The kingdom of God was near when the people were in fellowship, taking care of one another. It makes it really encouraging to imagine what it will be like when the kingdom of God is not just near, but present and available and obvious to everyone. Now, what about the scary son of man coming on clouds in power and great glory? It's, it's intimidating, to say the least, but we shouldn't be afraid. Instead of fainting in fear, or even bowing in respect, we're to stand and lift up our heads. Remember, last week was Christ the King Sunday, and we just talked about Christ coming in glory as the King of creation. And one aspect of the kingship of Christ is that we are his servants. And the only way for servants to be ready to serve is for them to be on their feet, watching, paying attention, so that they're ready for their king. In the same way that the kingdom of God is gonna come like leaves in the spring, a sign of good weather, bringing prosperity, the son of man is gonna come and bring justice and righteousness. We see justice and righteousness in our reading from Jeremiah this morning. And while Jeremiah wasn't talking specifically about Jesus, he was imagining a future in which justice and righteousness would be the most important characteristics, would be the dominant characteristics, not military power, not wealth, not political maneuvering, justice and righteousness. On the first Sunday of Advent, when many of us are peeking ahead to Christmas, the Christmas music is playing in stores and in our cars and in our homes. We're thinking of God coming to earth in the form of an infant. Our lectionary asks us to look not back 2,000 years ago, but to some unknowable time in the future. The Son of Man will come as king and judge we will stand before the Son of Man, ready to serve our King, and also in anticipation of His judgment. In this season of, of waiting, of anticipation, it's easy to allow our anticipation to turn into anxiety, especially if part of what we're anticipating is judgment. Segments of today's Gospel even seem to imply that that anxiety is warranted. But the Christ who is to come and the kingdom that is to come aren't unknown quantities. Holy Scripture tells us who Christ was. Our prayer life and our relationships with each other tell us who Christ is. We who know and love Jesus watch for the Son of Man coming with the clouds, not in the sense of fear or dread, but with a sense of excitement. Because where Christ is, there is hope and joy, and fellowship, and justice, and righteousness, and thank God, also grace. Advent is the already and not yet. The mystery of Advent is that it forces us to recognize Christ who has come, Christ who will come, and Christ who is with us now, who was, and is, and is to be, who ushered in the kingdom that came near, that will come nearer still, and is also near now. The Son of Man is not yet here with his clouds and majesty, but we do know him already. And when he does come with power and glory, it will be like green growth on a tree after a freeze, a promise of life to come. Stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Redemption that is freedom justice and righteousness. This redemption is coming. Thanks be to God.
Please stand. We'll affirm our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed on page 358. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please turn to page 388, the Book of Common Prayer. The Prayers of the People, Form 4. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. In the dioxysin cycle of prayer, we give thanks for the Church of the Advent, Brownsville, St. Andrew's Seguin, and St. Andrew's San Antonio. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially Svitlana, Eugene, Elena, Dennis, Oksana, Anisia, and her brother, Sam, Judy, Travis, Troy, Daryl, Carol, Robin, Nikki, Marco, Pat, Karen, Anne, the Bandy family, Russ, Aaron, Brandon, Tara, Stephen, Terry and Frank, Peyton, Elmo and Janet, Ashley, Johnny, and Tamara. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
Hasten, O Father, the coming of your kingdom and grant that we, your servants, who now live by faith, may soon with joy behold your Son at his coming in glorious majesty. Amen. Now turning to page 360, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess.